few minutes to, to let people in before we start with the webinar. you want to already share your presentation so we have the first slide okay good yes very good thank you okay Okay, let's let's wait another half a minute before we start. Okay, number of participants is stagnating. I, I think we can start with this webinar now. Webinar now. Uh, so first of all, from my side and on behalf of my co-moderators, Iab Shivan and Enrico Tessitori, welcome to this. Um, ENS webinar of the spine section, um, which we have tonight in, in our sequence of, of webinars. Um, as always, we have one speaker, we'll have an, a discussion afterwards. For the discussion, as always, please use the F &A Q and a box or, or the chat box, and we will read out the, the question for our presenter. Um, tonight, we're going to talk about one very common problem of the spine. Uh, but it's still it's still a problem where um, clear treatment for several cases always is a bit unsure and uh, always asking what what the right way is to treat uh, the, those diseases. Um, the topic tonight is fragility and fractures of the spine, current treatment concept, and we have an important speaker on this topic. We have Klaus Schnake. He is uh, the the chairman of the spine section. Or the, the spinal department uh, of the Wahlkrankenhaus in St. Marien in Erlangen in Germany. He's the chairman of the AO Spine Knowledge Forum Trauma and the chair of the spine section of the German Society of Orthopedics and Trauma, where he's very active and was co inventor of a classification of those fragility fractures and a scoring of those fragility fractures. So he's a real specialist in the treatment and in planning and treatment. Of fragility spectra and fractures. And Claude, we're looking forward to your presentation tonight to show us what the right way is to handle those osteoporotic or fragility fractures of the spine. Klaus, welcome, and we're looking forward to your presentation. Thanks, Florian. Thanks a lot for the kind invitation. Thanks to EANS for having me tonight. Uh, it's a pleasure to spend some time with you, together with you, and share some of our ideas and concepts we have developed over the past, I would say, 10 years with regard to osteoporotic fractures, whether they are fragility fractures or trauma. So I would like to share my ideas, see some of my disclosures, and they are not really related to this talk. Um, just to give you a short introduction, because not all of you are aware where Erlangen is. Erlangen is a city, a university city close to Nuremberg and Bavaria. And um, this is uh, this uh, where my my uh, my spine center is located, and uh, we are not only dealing with uh, fractures, but mostly with the generation, and uh, we have a special <coughs> aspect or on uh, deformity surgeries. So this is where we work, and um, now I would like to focus on the topic osteoporosis and fragility fractures. So. Uh, the number and percentage of the global population over the age of 65 is steadily increasing. And uh, by 2050, we will have worldwide around 17%, which uh, are older than 65. In Europe, as well as in some aging countries, it's already like this. So we are focusing a situation where people get older and older. And with this, the number of, of osteoporotic fractures are, is steadily increasing too. 
When we see here the data 1990 to 2050, we see that will, for Europe, for instance, will it almost double the numbers of osteoporotic fractures. So we, this a real problem we have to deal with. We have to be aware that these fractures are, will be, are currently already, but will be the most common things we uh, have to deal with in, in spinal um, trauma. In Germany, the incidence of fractures at all was 112 to 100,000 in 2019, but two-thirds already were over 70 years old. So the majority are older. And the, there was an increase over 10 years in almost 20% in of the lumbar spine and more than 30% in the thoracic spine. And mostly because of the elderly patients, mostly, of course, these osteoporotic fractures. And uh, what is important to know is that the risk of a consecutive fracture within one year after the first fracture is about 20%. And if the patients have more than one fracture, this risk increased to 24% and gets even higher. So it's uh, fractures of the spine are a real problem, osteoporotic fractures, because while in comparison to hip maybe or to the uh, to the ankle or the wrist where you have only two, you know, you have uh, 12 vertebral uh, thoracic uh, thoracic vertebral bodies, you have uh, five lumbar bodies, and you have uh, the sacrum. So there are a lot of things which can fracture. And not because of this only, but because of their ongoing, it's an ongoing disease, the mortality after osteoporotic fracture is higher than in all the other fracture forms. So in comparison to hip, shoulder, forearm, you'll see that the spine, the mortality is steadily increasing. It's always higher than in the other. So it is a life-threatening disease, so we have to treat it, and not only surgi surgically, of course, but with medication as well. I will come to this a little bit later. So we need to know a little bit about osteoporotic fragility fractures. And the most common um, facts are that they are mostly compressive or compression fractures. So they are either A1 or A3, according to aerospine. But the aerospine classification was not really made for these fractures. I'll come back to this later. Higher degree of instabilities in terms of B and C types injuries are rather uncommon. They account for only 2% of all the fractures. And neurological deficits are rare too. Mostly radiculopathies, but very rare, you know, compression, uh, compressive um, or any kind of uh, incomplete or complete uh, spinal cord injury. That's really rare. Progressive kyphosis, on the other hand, is quite common, especially if the T-score is very low. So the lower the T-score, the higher the risk of having an ongoing, sintering, ongoing kyphosing. And there are different morphologies and natural courses in comparison to healthy bone fractures. So it's a different entity. And by just looking at the x-rays or the CT scan, you cannot distinguish whether the patient with osteoporosis had a trauma or just a fragility fracture. They look quite similar. And therefore, we have created a, a, a classification which covers both. Uh, the only difference is that a patient with a trauma has typically a high degree of fracture, while fragility fractures mostly start with rather, um, uh, with rather compressions and rather minor injuries. So in a combined effort of the German uh, Society for Orthopedics and Trauma, as well as the AO, we have um, uh, developed a classification which is called OF for osteoporotic fracture classification. It's relatively easy to remind. There's only five subtypes. I will just show you in a second how it looks like. It starts from a simple bone edema and ends with a severe deformity, and it uh, reflects a typical osteoporotic fracture's morphologies and it's based on CT scan, MRI, and X-rays. So that's what it looks like. We have published this already in 2018 internationally, and it has become a kind of standard, at least in the, uh, the German-speaking countries, and um, we have evaluated it already within the aerospine internationally, and uh, it is a reliable classification which you can be used. And um, it starts with a simple bone edema, that's the OF1. Mostly you see this accidentally when you make an MRI, you're looking for another fracture. And by accident, you see that there's another body is uh, shining. Then the OF2 is a deformation of one end plate without or with only minor posterior wall involvement. Then you have a deformation of one end plate with a distinct posterior wall involvement. That's the OF3. That's a, something which we would say, well, it looks like an incomplete burst type injury. Then we have the group of OF4, which are deformations of both end plates with or without posterior wall involvement. So either complete burst type injuries, fishbone or pincer type injuries. And then finally, the rather rare OF5, which are injuries with either anterior but mostly posterior tension band failure. 
So O of 1 and O of 5 are rare. They account for only 5%. The others are O of 2, O of 3, O of 4. And the most uh, typical one we have to treat surgically are the, the O of 4 and O of 5. Well, how can we treat them? There are different options, of course, conservative with or without orthosis, uh, just the augmentation with kyphoplasty or vertebroplasty or short stabilization, uh, plus minus an augmentation or any kind of long stabilization or even anterior posterior. And I will focus a little bit on this and tell you what can be done. So the typical therapy in these patients is a conservative therapy. However, conservative, not always works and around about one third of the patients fail after conservative treatment, especially if they are old, frail, if they have a low T-score, less than minus three, and if they have diff, um, uh, several um, uh, radiological parameters like birth type injuries, like an initial uh, quick height loss, like intravertebral clefts, when the fracture is located at the thoracolumbar junction, when they already have a decompensated sagittal balance or they develop it uh, due to the fracture. And like in these uh, illustrations here, if there are specific MRI fracture types where the anterior wall of the, um, of the vertebral body is somehow affected and broken. So these are risk factors we know which can lead to a failure of the conservative treatment. And here's an, a case example of a patient, 79 years old. The pain started five weeks ago after just a rotation. So it's a fragility fracture. Now the patient came along while this and had pain while standing, sitting and walking, showed a fracture of L3 as well as L4, had some typical comorbidities. And then we performed an MRI. We saw that there's a fresh fracture at L4 with a spinal canal stenosis. And the T-score was rather low with minus 2.9. So an, a risk factor for ongoing uh, sintering and uh, a risk factor for uh, failure of conservative treatment. And the CT scan shows that there's a mix, which is quite typical of old and fresh. So some parts at the L4 rather looks a little bit like older, but this can happen really even after a couple of weeks or several months that the fracture is still active, but you know, it's like, it's um, um, it's an ongoing fracture. It's not really healed. It's not really totally sclerotic. So it's still there's instability. And the L3 fracture was relatively new. It was not even there on the MRI we, we performed a week before. So we have two fractures here. The L3 we would schedule or uh, classify as OF2 because there's one end plate deformation and a minor posterior wall involvement, not a severe one. And the four, uh, L4 is an OF4. That means both end plates are affected here together with the posterior wall. So we have O of three, O of two, excuse me, and O of four. And here, when the patient has still pain, uh, suffers from kind of claudication, in that case, we stabilized this patient percutaneously, uh, extended the stabilization to L3, and uh, the augmented the screws, and we performed a de uh, minimal invasive, so micro decompression at the level of L3, 4, where the, um, the stenosis was. Another example of a failed conservative treatment here, 86 year old woman. She had a couple of uh, comorbidities, which is uh, not, uh, which is common within, in this age. She was, on the other hand, she was not that frail. Uh, the frailty index was only two. So I will tell you a little bit about the frailty index in a second. And she had a fall three months ago. Um, now, with increasing pain, VAS was already eight. She could not walk freely. She could not really stand upright. She needed the help, and she had a, but she had no neurological deficit. And that's where the images when when she came, we were able to hold her up a little bit and make an X-ray, and you see that's marked kyphosis here at this level. And in the MRI, you can see that there's a vertebral uh, cleft um, and uh, that there's a elongated PLC. So the prosthetic ligaments are are elongated and therefore we would classify this as an OF5. And you see that the uh, adjacent uh, vertebral body is already affected. Typically when this works over a couple of months so that the, there's a force which is uh, then um, acting or, you know, um, affecting the, the next vertebral body. So yes, canal stenosis, uh, elongated PLC, as I said, and the local kyphosis was 50 degrees. So these are the APs. And here, of course, then there are different options. And we think that this is could be a case for either a long stabilization. We performed a hyperboclion to see whether she opens up or not, but she didn't that much, to be honest. So that was relatively stiff. 
And therefore we decided here to correct her in a very short but effective way with an anterior posterior correction. First, we start with a percutaneous stabilization with PMMA augmentation of the screws and decompressed at T12 and followed by a thoracoscopic assisted miniaturacotomy, a copectomy and a vertebral body replacement. And this is how it looks like postoperatively. A um, lot of cement, a lot of metal, you would say, but it's quite effective, a relatively strong construct. And uh, this is already a, a follow-up of 12 months. And even the uh, sagittal parameters were not that bad. SVAF plus 8 centimeters is not perfect, but for an 86-year-old lady, it's acceptable. PILL mismatch was only 9 degrees, and uh, local kyphosis was reduced to 60 degrees. And this lasted uh, at least for one year, so that's the follow-up we have in this very old lady. So... The decision when to operate depends on clinical as well as radiological parameters. Surgery is typically indicated when the pain is above five on VAS, when the patient is immobile or doesn't get really back to the normal mobilization. When you have a low T-score, which is a risk, as I told, as a risk factor, what I told you. Of course, when there are neurological, neurological deficits and if you see an ongoing centering or kyphosing. Conservative treatment is most typically possible in a mobile patient with moderate pain and if a patient is really frail or has a lot of comorbidities. In order to put this together a little bit and make it more practical in, in our daily work, we created, so we is the German Orthopedic and Trauma Society as well, the AOSPI Knowledge from Trauma, we created a score. And this score, uh, the OF score for osteoporotic fractures, combines all this and gives the help in daily clinical practice to judge whether a patient probably needs surgery or not. So it has includes the parameter morphology according to the OF score, the severity of osteoporosis. You can either use a T score if available or the QTCT. The Hounsfield units of are below 90. If there's a deformity progression, if you see the patient at different time points, what is the pain under adequate analgesia? Is it still above five or not? What are the neurological symptoms? Do they have one? Yes or no? Is the patient mobile under adequate analgesia? And what about the health status? Here we account for the ASA uh, status as well for the modified five item um, frailty index. This is a very easy to uh, index to assess. It only has arterial hip hypertension, uh, coronal heart disease. It has um, the um, uh, um, the COPD, so chronic obstructive pulmonary disease or um, uh, pneumonia recently, and has diabetes as well as it uh, considers the situation in terms of nursing, yes or no, so how dependent the patient is. It's relatively easy to assess, so easy for surgeons. It's made for surgeons, I would say. And if this modified frailty index is above two, the risk of any complications when you operate the patient is increasing dramatically, so significantly, and whether the patient has anticoagulation. So all of this gets into account. That is point. Even if you don't have information with regard to deformity progression or the severity of osteoporosis maybe, or you don't know all the health status, you can still use this score because it even works if you have only morphology, pain, neurological symptoms, as well as the uh, the uh, mobilization. So even with this, you can use the score. And the score idea was to say, okay, if there are more than six points, we would recommend surgery. If there are more than less than six points, uh, we would uh, recommend conservative treatment. So to give you an example how this works, one example here, it's in, um, a fracture of T12. It's uh, with an incomplete burst type injury. So a one end plate is affected with a distinct posterior wall involvement. So it's an OL3. Pain was relatively high, seven, and the patient was bedridden due to the pain. And here, when we, uh, um, when we use the score, we see that there are six points for the morphology, one point for the bone mineral density, another point for the pain, Another point because the patient is not mobile and the overall health status was okay but despite an active anticoagulation and here the results would be eight points. However, we typically treat all patients for a couple of days until a week conservatively to see whether they whether they get better or not. And the score can be taken every day. After one week, we took the score again. Nothing really changed except that the anticoagulation was gone. So again, nine points surgical therapy. And in that case, we performed a short percutaneous stabilization with PMMA augmentation of the screws and the kyphoplasty of the affected vertebral T12. And this is already a six months post-op image. So this score, 
actually is a help in daily practice. It's not, uh, you don't have to use it, but it helps. And in order to evaluate it, we performed um, uh, a multi-center prospective study in Germany. We included 17 centers, 518 patients, 174 got conservative and 344 surgical treatment. And we saw when we evaluated that the surgical patients had more severe fractures, which is understandable, they had lower, higher pain and lower mobility, so the OF score was higher. The overall complications were rather acceptable, I would say. In the conservative, they were, of course, relatively uh, um, low, 3%. In the surgical group, we had 13% of complications, although the complications were mostly uh, medical complications, rarely surgical. And all in patients improved clinically, but significant better improvement we, we saw with regard to the mobility in the surgical group. So surgery typically leads to a quicker return to the mobility level patients had. So patients can typically walk outside of the out of the hospital. Um, we have looked at our own data in my clinic. So we included 84 patients, 60 could be evaluated. The T-score, as you see, was really low, minus four, average age was 76. And out of these 60 patients, the half of them got uh, kyphoplasty, the other posterior instrumentation, and the other 24% kyphoplasty. And of course, we had conservative patients as well. The majority of patients had over four uh, frac type fracture. That's quite common that you see them coming to the hospitals because over one or two and many over three can be treated as an in an outpatient uh, setting. And if you look on the right side, you see the OF score points, and you see that the watershed of six, where um, both surgical as well as conservative treatment are possible, is relatively low. Only 8% of the patients had an uh, OF score for six. So the others had either a clear indication for surgery or is clear indication for conservative treatment. And what we found is that the patient uh, who were treated according to the score um, developed uh, the minimal clinical important difference in the ODI as well as the VIS over time um, to the last follow-up, which was on average like 5.5 months uh, post-treatment. Uh, um, uh, post so you can see here that patients got better in both groups, but um, they uh, were quicker mobile in the group of the surgical patients. And what is, I think, what is very important is whether the patients uh, get to the uh, same mobility level like uh, they had before the fracture. And here, the OF's concordant therapy, so the therapy um, which um, followed the OF um, recommendation, whether surgical or not, led to quite good outcomes. And you can see here that the mobility compared before the fracture and the follow-up was more or less the same. So 95 or 97 percent of the patients got back to the same level of mobility like they had before the fracture. And I think that's quite important for these old patients, that they get back to the same mobility level. We have uh, published this in uh, all these data in um, a recent um, uh, special issue of the German, of the Global Spine Journal. Um, there's uh, this study here where we put all the data from the 518 patients and from the 17 centers. And in this um, uh, work, we concluded that patients treated according to the scores recommendation showed favorable short-term clinical results. Short times means up to six months. Um, but this is, I personally think, the most important time that the patients get back relatively quick out of the hospital, back to the normal daily activity level. We um, looked further for the uh, OF4 patients. So we uh, we had 152 patients who had an OF4 fracture type. Both, they received both non-operative as well as operative treatment. And here again, the OF score was a meaningful aid to decide whether these patients with, with this um, higher degree of fractures can be treated non-operatively or surgically. So again, the majority of patients who received surgery got this short uh, fixator this uh, percutaneous uh, fixation with uh, PMMA augmentation. And finally, we uh, checked the rather rare of five fractures. We had 19 in this group. Um, they mostly received surgical stabilization. What we found here was that the clinical results were quite good, actually. However, we had a 45% post-operative complication rate. Again, mostly uh, medical complications, and, and we had no death in this group. However, these, if you are rather aggressive in, in these elderly patients, you have to, you will, you, you will, 
inevitably um, see some complications. So to say, well, what kind of fractures, uh, how can we treat them? The surgical options we have, I would just uh, re um, go through them. So we have the augmentations like kyphoplasty or vertebroplasty, which are suitable for OF1, 2, 3, and OF4 as well. Um, mostly we perform kyphoplasty. We rather use uh, vertebroplasty, but this is whatever you like. However, kyphoplasty, as you know, has a lower cement uh, leakage rate and quite interesting, just a recent meta-analysis um, uh, revealed that uh, kyphoplasty especially um, uh, reduced the uh, risk of mortality by 18%. And in a subgroup analysis, there were already 71% reduction um, in the short-term follow-up. So kyphoplasty is an effective treatment, not only for pain, but it can obviously reduce mortality. Quite interesting, I think, and something maybe we can discuss later. So we have performed an own study, including 156 patients with O3 two, three, and four fractures, and they receive kyphoplasty. And what we found, again, what there's a significant reduction in pain, and, and that in the O3 and O4 type fractures, even the vertebral body height could be increased and the local kyphosis could be reduced. And therefore, we, th and, uh, we think that kyphoplasty is even possible in the subtypes of O4 fractures, um, but you should not use it when there's a marked posterior wall involvement or when there's a high degree of comminution because then the cement cannot really uh, work. Then the cement will probably leak out of the vertebral body. But otherwise, it's something, it's a very effective treatment. In all the others, <laughs> short percutaneous hybrid constructs are, are meaningful, uh, opt is a meaningful option. Uh, especially if you have some like a local kyphosis, if you want to correct it, if you have a virtual body which you cannot really augment, then uh, these uh, short uh, hybrid constructs are really powerful. Um, however, they are not really good um, or great data in terms of um, of RCTs or not so many um, uh, prospective studies, but the studies we've seen, mostly retrospective, show that the uh, complication rate is rather low, that the patient's uh, outcome is typically quite good, and uh, that there's relatively uh, uh, minor loss of reduction over time and not so many uh, implant failures. So this works uh, in many cases where uh, kyphoplasty alone or vertebroplasty alone is not meaningful. The long open or percutaneous uh, hybrid constructs are sometimes necessary for some subgroups of O5 and O4, or if you have like multiple fractures, then we typically today um, advise to cement the uppermost and lowermost screws, not uh, all the screws like you can see here in, the, in these examples. So today we think that it's enough to cement the uppermost and lowermost screw pair, uh, but not all the screws in order to reduce cement leakage, which typically occurs if you cement screws. Anterior posterior constructs as well as osteotomies are sometimes necessary. We have already showed you an example. And um, therefore, um, this uh, is sometimes necessary in order to achieve good results, but today we can use this, do this in um, a minimal invasive fashion. I would just give you an example here of an 81-year-old female. She had a severe osteoporosis, a fracture of T11 and T12 over five. So the posterior elements were elongated and gone. She had an O score points uh, of uh, score of 12 points so it was a clear indication for surgery you can see here that this is already a long uh, situation which lasts for a couple of months so the virtual body is gone you see this cleft so it's open up and if we go back and show you the standing image you see the marked kyphosis and in the supine position you see how it opens up so it's really unstable and therefore here i think a long construct is necessary uh, as well as something to put in the front. And today we can do this in a minimal invasive way. We performed a percutaneous screws uh, fixation from the back. And then with a mini toracotomy, this is six centimeter incision, uh, two level corpectomy and a cage. And these are already images um, 1.5 years after the surgery. That was the time we could follow her up. Um, 
today i would say the it would have been better probably to extend a little bit maybe the uh, the uh, fixation to the mid thoracic spine we stopped here um at at the level of uh, i think it's t9 uh, and the patient uh, um, developed an adjacent fracture but was not of that in that pain, so we didn't have to revise her. So we had a follow up of 1.5 years, and I think that's fine for this old lady. However, we have still some unsolved questions, like what about the length of the stabilization? You can see here examples were short examples as well as long examples where it failed, you know. So sometimes, whatever you do, it fa can fail. So this implant loosening and uh, implant failure is a, is a problem, is still a problem, and we do not have the ideal answers to solve it. So sometimes short uh, stabilization works, sometimes not. And even sometimes long stabilization do not work. So that's difficult. And something we are focusing right now is what happens if you have a pre-existing uh, clinical relevant degeneration. Like in that case here, you can see the patient had a fracture and in the lower lumbar spine, some degenerative spondylolisthesis plus old fractures, plus spinal stenosis. And this patient, this patient here was uh, suffering from claudication before um, he, he got the fracture. So there was a question what to do. Should we address only the fracture? Should we do both? We decided to address both, but is this good? Is this meaningful? That's the thing we have to discuss. So another unsolved question. Um, just one slide uh, regarding the uh, pre and post uh, medical uh, treatment. So I think it's uh, crucial that all the patients receive not only vitamin D and somehow calcium, but specific medications. And we typically think that teriparatide as well as the newer drug Romozozumab are quite meaningful because they are really effective and they have proved to be significantly ef more effective than uh, bisphosphonates. So when patients come along and do have a fracture, or at least, or if they have more than one fracture, we advise them to start with teriparatide right away, which is possible in Germany, or with romozozumab, um, because these patients do have already a fracture. And we know that um, the use of uh, teriparatide works in postoperatively quite well. It uh, helps uh, to prevent screw losing as well as it can help if you, even if you have an elective surgery or you plan an elective surgery and then the patient, you prepare the patients beforehand. So it definitely makes sense to think about how to improve the bone quality and teriparatide as well as teri, um, uh, romozozumab are options. So in conclusion, the OF classification, the score I showed you and the current treatment recommendations do work, obviously, we could prove this. And however, they're expert based and they're, what they do, they're just reflecting the actual status and knowledge we have. Um, it's not perfect, but I think it's a, it's a good help. Um, you can use the OF score on a daily basis. You can judge the patient. You can see whether he or she gets better or not, and then decide whether to operate or not. The OF classification helps us to discuss uh, about fracture types. Um, and therefore we know it's, uh, it's uh, I think it reflects more the typical fracture um, patterns like uh, in comparison to other classifications. The conservative therapy is definitely the first choice in the majority of patients, especially if they are mobile and the, the pain is moderate. However, remember that one third of the patients fail and uh, do remember the, uh, the risk factors. If we perform surgery, kyphoplasty and the hybrid stabilizations are our surgical workhorses. That in the majority of patients, we come along with this. Uh, kyphoplasty is quite good, effective in pain treatment. However, if you have severe, if you have a, a, a deformity, so kyphosis, or if the vertebral body is really gone, then probably a hybrid stabilization is better and uh, it gets, you get more reliable results. Uh, more aggressive surgical strategies are sometimes necessary, especially for this old or failed conservative cases where you have a, um, where the virtual body is more or less gone, where you have this endosome lesions and where you have this uh, severe deformities, then you need um, uh, you need more uh, surgery. And here anterior posterior, if you can do it in a minimal invasive uh, fashion, are quite effective too. However, comorbidities, adjacent fractures and implant failures are still challenging. So we have not solved all the problems. Um, 
the judgment of the frailty of the patient is helpful to to estimate how likely uh, complications are. So if a patient is really frail, we try to avoid um, uh, the the uh, the surgery. And um, so in order to reduce the chance that the patient do not profit from it at all. And of course, don't forget the adequate medication for the osteoporosis. That's crucial, you know, to avoid further fractures and to reduce the mortality mortality of uh, the osteoporosis. Short outlook before I finish um, about sacral fractures, osteoporotic sacral fractures. The same working group I uh, was just talking to, so from the German Orthopedic and Trauma Society, has developed a uh, pelvic classification for osteoporotic sacral and pelvic ring fractures. Uh, we have published this already, and um, the uh, interrater reliability was substantial, was really very good, and the intrarater reliability um, was even perfect. So this is a relatively easy classification for sacral fractures. I would like to show it to you. It again is like the OF classification, has only five subgroups. It starts with the bony edemer at any location of the pelvic ring, because sometimes if you perform an MRI and you see the coronal steel sequence, you accidentally see, oh, there's maybe one, one side, the sacrum is shining, the steel sequence, and then even if you don't see anything in the CT scan, but there's already a bony edema, and there's sometimes the cause of pain in patients if they have, uh, if they um, come to you with low low back pain. So I advise always to perform an MRI. If you perform an MRI of the lumbar spine, to perform an coronal uh, steer sequence because there you can detect whether they have uh, uh, sacral fracture. OFP2 uh, is an isolated fracture of the anterior pelvic ring, uni or bilateral, typically something you would treat conservatively, of course. OFP3 is a unilateral sacral fracture with or without any lesion of the anterior ring. Um, here, then, depending on the type of on the on the uh, there's dislocation or not, if the patient is in pain, you may start with therapy in terms of putting any kind of screws, mostly percutaneous. An OFP means a bilateral sacral fracture with or without any lesion of the anterior ring. Here, in many occasions, uh, many occasions, um, surgery with uh, iliosacral or transiliosacral screws, or sometimes if you have a transverse component, even lumbopelvic stabilizations might be necessary. And the rather rare OFP5 are transiliacal or transiliosacral fractures uh, with or without any lesion of the anterior ring. And um, together with this, the, some modifiers come. We have three modifiers here in this classification. These They indicate more severe injury. Um, a single or in combination are there possible. So um, one is a lateral process in the CT scan, like you can see under A here. Where the, where the arrow is, so because this is a sign that there's a higher degree of instability, then dislocation at any um, localization is another sign for instability, as well as uh, vertebral body edema, like in that case, E and F, you can see in the CT scan in the iliac, uh, in the ilium, you can't see anything, but then if you have an MRI, you see that's an additional edema. So these are three modifiers, and why do we need modifiers? Because we have developed a score for osteoporotic pelvic fractures. The score is currently only available in German. I apologize. We have not validated it and translated it to English yet, but you can see maybe that looks quite similar um, to the score I just presented to you with regard to the thoracolumbar fractured. This score here includes, again, the morphology, whether the patient is mobile or not, how the pain is, if they have neurolog neurological deficits, how the overall health status is, Asia modified frailty index, et cetera, and some modifiers. And we just um, uh, evaluated this score until last year, and we are now um, uh, putting all the data together. We had, I think, uh, roughly 500 patients included, and we will come up with our results soon, and then we hope that we can elevate it, uh, evaluate it internationally. So to conclude, here's some take-home literature for you. All of this is free access, whether they are the scores or the classification. We have developed an app, which is website uh, based of the OF score, ofscore.l7lc.org. So it's easy to use in daily practice. And there we have, with the AO Spine together, we've even per, um, produced a classification video with may help you to use it and learn the classification if you're interested in. And with this, I would like to thank you for your attention. It was a pleasure for me to be here and I'm looking forward for your questions. Thanks a lot.
Thanks a lot, uh, Klaus, for the very nice presentation, comprehensive uh, approach to the osteoporotic fragility fractures. And um, I ask to the participant to uh, put their question in, in the chat. And uh, there is one uh, from, from the audience, which is actually, what do you mean by vertebral cleft on the X-rays and CT scan? Yeah, so vertebr vertebral clefts are gaps in the vertebral body, which can be seen in the MRI because they include, they there's fluid, fluid, so water or any kind of body fluid in the vertebral body. So it's typically on T2, it's, 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 it's uh, light. And um, in the CT scan, you see uh, mostly a vacuum phenomena. So you see any kind of uh, gap or void, you know, so... This mean, and if you compare it with the standing X-ray, you see that it's in the standing X-rays it kyphoses, and then in the MRI when they are so in the supine position it opens up, and then fluid gets into this. So there are gaps, voids in the, uh, the vertebral bodies, and they are a sign of instability, and they are a risk factor for ongoing kyphosing and um, a failure for conservative treatment. Thanks for your answer. Uh, I see that Florian has a. Hand up, please. Yeah. Thank you, Carl. Very, very nice presentation. Um, I have a question regarding the conservative therapy and I have a question regarding the surgical therapy. Uh, for the conservative therapy, is there any role for bracing or is bracing necessary? If bracing is necessary, what subtype of fractures? I, I do not use it anymore. I, I just have the patients mobilized, try to have a pain free without any bracing. What are your thoughts about this? And my second question would be a, about a surgical strategy. You showed some of the cases where you um, did go posterior and anterior, but in some cases it can be quite difficult to get a sufficient posterior correction in the osteoporotic soft bone when you go posterior first and try to correct the kyphosis and then go anterior. An alternative would be to do a do a, a vertebral shortening or spinal shortening where you do a, uh, a PSO or um wedge of the autonomy to close a cathodic deformity. There are worries that you're gonna destabilize the spine even further if you take the posterior column. Well, what do you think about this shortening as um to to correct for those cathodic deformities? Yeah Florian great important questions of course difficult questions too <laughs> um so bracing bracing when we in a thoracolumbar lumbar trauma, um, in bone healthy patients, so not in the elderly, there is no evidence at all that bracing works. So actually, there's no indication for bracing in in young or patient young patients or patients with good bone stock. In the elderly patients, there are two studies showing that they are where the patients benefited. So even one one was even as prospective and randomized. Um, so a recent meta-analysis showed, however, that the evidence is still not there to conclude that bracing in the elderly is of any help. So in doubt, you can say bracing is not really something you have to do because there's not the evidence is not good or not good enough to recommend it. So in general, we cannot really recommend bracing. Um, what I see in the daily practice is that when patients, when we treat patients conservatively and we um, and they complain when they walk and stand about a lot of pain, then and the physio, then we ask the physiotherapy to help them a little bit and to stabilize them sometimes manually to give them some aid. And when the patient then say, well, yeah, that helps me. That is like somebody is holding me, somebody is giving me more uh, better posture, then we prescribe a uh, dynamic orthosis. So individually, I would say bracing makes sense. In general, I do not, or we do not recommend bracing in these patients. The second question is about the um, when to how to, per, how to how to reduce the fracture. So what I think is quite helpful is to perform, of course, to see what happens uh, standing X-ray in comparison to CT scan or MRI. So you see how mobile this is, or uh, even perform in the in in older fractures, uh, hypomoclion, where, where you know you put a pillow or something under the back and then make an uh, supine X-ray to see how it opens up. And then I decide if I see that there's mobility. And that 
they typically do not reduce uh, physiologically, but if they markedly reduce, then I would say I would go for posterior because then I have a chance. But just doing some SPOs, some opening the facets, maybe even uh, to correct them quite nicely. So, and the goal is to correct them to I would say age adapted sagittal profile. That means that the idea is not to have an SVA of plus five centimeters, and it's ideally maybe on the S1 like in the 80-year-old patient I showed where the SVA was still 8, but I don't think that this is a big issue. So the idea is to put them back in a compensated sagittal balance, I would say, or disbalance, uh, where the SVA is typically something between 5 and maximum like 8, 9 centimeters. And if I see that they open up, I can do some SPOs or even sometimes ponties and achieve this. But the more aggressive, the more I take away from the posterior elements, the longer the construct has to be. I think the more points you need to fix it, to fix, uh, to, 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 yeah, to assure fixation. And um, then the problem starts with adjacent uh, segment problems, you know. So the longer the constructs, the, the higher the, the risk of, of adjacent issue or problems is. Osteotomies, I t as like PSO, etc. I try to avoid. Um, if there, if it's a fixed deformity, I rather go from anterior because typically, at least in my environment, we have the ability to do the, all this minimal invasive and thoracoscopically assisted, and then the blood loss is relatively low, and therefore I can do this or in the lumbar spine even do a retroperitoneal or lumbo lumbotomy. Uh, this is for me easier. I, it's more effective and I have less blood loss than if I perform a PSO. So I personally try to avoid PSOs in the elderly because PSO take time. Typically, blood loss is relatively high and then patients deteriorate and receive and uh, can develop complication. So Ponti's SPOs are good. Fixed gift deformity, I personally do an anterior release first and then put the patient uh, uh, and then open up the patient. Does this answer hey. your question? Yes, I think so. I think so. And there are many questions coming up from the participants before giving the word to Hihab. Uh, I just like to uh, ask you from Afghanistan, in case of fixation or screw loosening after fixation, what is your advice in terms of uh, revision surgery? Is it difficult or not? And how, what do you suggest for? Yeah, so um, there is... It's, it isn't a problem at all. If you, oh, let's start differently. If you augment a screw, what you perform is you, the risk of pulling out the screw is definitely lower. So the force that withstand the screws is the pull out forces, but not torque. So it's relatively easy to take out a screw which has been cemented because the, the these PMMA bridges break immediately. So you don't need a lot of force to um, to take the screws out. If you want to put another screw in, I advise to tap, you know, because then you have a chance that you can get in a bigger screw and cement it again. But taking out a cemented screw which got loose over there is not a problem, I would say. And the second question is from Ukraine. Uh, do you perform densitometry or calcium levels before each surgery? Um, in fractures, typically you don't have that time. If a patient has an, a kind of acute fracture, so you have maybe one week. If possible, we do a CT scan mostly to, to judge the fracture, to classify it, etc. And then we perform a QCT, so quantitative CT scan, which is relatively easy. And everything above 130 is not a problem. Typically not everything from 100, below 100 is osteopenia, below 90, 80 is definitely severe osteoporosis. We advise to augment screws when the Hounsfield units are below 100. So everything below 100 should be, we advise to say, put in cement, also cement the screws. Um, typically we advise the patients after our treatment to re receive a DEXA measurement because the medication and the medical therapy is based on DEXA measurement and not on QCT. So QCT is helpful for our surgeons to estimate whether the bone quality is good or not and to uh, to judge whether we need any PMMA or not. But it's not good or it's not a reliable or not um, evalu evaluated uh, parameter for medical therapy. Um, and uh, if we have an elective patient, so we do a lot of deformities here and we have older patients and all the patients we do elective surgery 
when they need reduction or correction of deformity. And if they are older, the females are older than 50, we want a DEXA measurement or QCT beforehand. And if we see that they have an osteoporosis, we start with medical treatment before we perform the surgery because it's elective surgery. We can do a deformity correction in three or six months. We don't have to do it right away. So they can get treatment beforehand. We don't check calcium levels. We don't check, so because I think does, that doesn't make sense. Typically, wise, we advise all the patients to take vitamin D because there's a lack of sun, at least here in our environment and in the winter. So there's vitamin D is, I would say, never a problem. So all of them get vitamin D before surgery and post-op surgery. Thanks a lot. Hihab, you had a question to Klaus? Yes, thank you very much, Klaus. Again, as always, great talks. My question is a little bit uh, clinically based, simple. Uh, do you have a cutoff time where you go from conservative to surgical treatment? Let's say if she doesn't have any progression of the uh, deformity, only pain, do you, how long would you wait for medical treatment? Yeah, I think this depends a little bit on which society and uh, you are and whatever the health system is and how much time you have. I mean, the, a patient who is mobile can be discharged and then can be, of course, can come back again in a week and get to receive uh, an, a standing x-ray to see whether, you know, what happens and how the pain. In my, my experience is if they do not really center, sin, ongoing sintering means that they have ongoing kyphosing. So if they do not kyphose, um, then typically they are stable with the pain as well. So mostly in kyphosing comes together with pain, stable situation, mostly with reduction of pain. So I think these standing x-rays are quite helpful to objectively study, uh, judge what happens. Um, if we have an inpatient and he's, we do not get them really out of the bed, then we would say wait three to five days, we'd perform the score and if they do not get better, we would then, after I would say five days, you would judge and say, okay, let's go for surgery. I mean, if we have an O5 or O4 with a, where, where it's clear, we go to mm -hmm. surgery right away, like two, three days later. But the other patients receive typically a conservative trial of five to seven days. And if they do not, if they are not mobile enough, we start, we, and the score says is above seven, six points, we go for surgery. But you can, of course, if you have the ability, you can wait for longer. So, you know, it depends on the health system you're working in. There is another question to you, Klaus, from uh, the participants. Uh, in case of stabilization, when do you recommend to put screws into the vertebral fracture level? And when do you choose kyphoplasty or vertebroplasty then? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, the um, Well, we don't have, we have some data with regard to this stabilization plus kyphoplasty. We do not have data available yet uh, when you put this index, this short screws in the vertebral body, like we do it in the uh, in the patient with good bone stock. Why? Why shouldn't it work? So I think it may work. Why? How? How I judge it? If there's a chance that with the kyphoplasty I can put in cement, reduce the fracture, increase the height of the vertebral body, I would probably go for cement. If I see that there's a kind of fishbone vertebral body, if there's a lot of destruction where I say, well, where will my cement go? So it's likely that I will have leakage. I would recommend, and I would, and I would, if I want to stay short, then I would go for an next screw. So if a kyphoplasty is possible, I do kyphoplasty. If, if I doubt, I put the short index screws. And this helps us to stay short, you know, to make, make a bisegmental stabilization and to put another short screw in the virtual the fractured vertebral body. And uh, do you find that a uh, cortical bone trajectory is beneficial for uh, pedicle screws in osteoporotic patients? Yeah, I can tell you a story. I mean, um, we have this robot, you know, and we have the Mazor robot, and therefore we said, oh, that's a great tool because these uh, cortical bone trajectory screws, or Metronic calls them mass midlift mid screws or something like this, they're not easy to to place and they have to place to be placed exactly otherwise they do not work so we said oh that's great now we have a robot so we can do this yes technically we could we could do this but i can tell you we um if you like if you have maybe one or two segments it may work everything below 
we had failures, a lot of failures. So we a monosegmental or bisegmental stabilization may work if you don't you need apply too much forces. So reduction is I think difficult, but just for stabilization, one segment or two segments work. But we used it for uh, elective degenerative cases, and um, we had to revise almost all of them. You know, so the, that's my sorry. personal experience. Maybe we are not. It's good also mine. It is also mine with these screws. And um, last question: What is the, what is ongoing sintering in your presentation? Mean? Yeah, that's this ongoing. That's uh, progressive kyphosing. So if the spine, if sintering is means that the vertebral body height is decreasing over time, so that sinters goes together, and this comes typically with an ongoing kyphosing. So. Uh, situation where we see on the x-rays that the spine curve forces more and more that the virtual body height is decreasing more and more thanks a lot before uh, giving the word to uh, florian for the closure um of course a personal thank to you for uh, joining us tonight and i think that there are two main concepts which are very important apart from the interest of your classification that you, you do we do use in switzerland um it is also the assessment of post-traumatic deformity because we know that especially in osteoporotic frail patients, uh, deformity begets deformity. So there is an interest to restore the vertebral height and the parallelism on the end plates, in, in my opinion. Uh, and doing x-rays, standing x-rays is very important. We do uh, still see a lot of bedridden patients in geriatric hospitals. They even don't send them to x-ray assessment because they're afraid about the instability. Uh, so uh, the concept is these fractures are a low energy uh, fracture. So the pending instability is existing, but it's not that high as a post-traumatic uh, fracture in, in a young patient. And the, the second concept, of course, is the follow-up of this patient. If it's although you choose for a, uh, for a conservative treatment, this patient uh, must be seen again uh, one week, 10 days afterwards with a new x-ray because this is an ongoing process and you might have OF2 fracture becoming OF3 or 4 and so with the pending instability. And the last but not least is also the importance of the interdisciplinary discussion because, for example, in Switzerland, uh, insurances will not reimburse the, the, the procedure if the case has not been discussed in, in this interdisciplinary way together with the rheumatologists or internal medicine doctors uh, to share the decision about the about the indication to surgery or not. And of course, the, the main thing is that if you discuss with them before, they were ready to follow the patient and to start uh, the medical treatment, which is crucial. This is part of the of the wall treatment. So uh, again, a big thanks to you, Klaus and uh, Florian. Uh, I think it's time to close. Yeah, thank you, Enrico. Uh, yeah, it's time to close. And uh, Jeff, you, you already concluded about the the yeah, fragility fractures. Uh, thank you, Klaus. Very nice presentation. I think it was a very fruitful discussion, and many, many points, many important points were, were touched and discussed um, after the very excellent presentation. Um, I'd like to thank, in addition to our presenter and moderators, I'd like to thank all uh, attendees who came who joined us for this webinar um, in, uh, in the series of, of AO Spine Section webinars. So our next webinar will not be on May one, which would be our typical, you know, typical interval, the next, uh, the next uh, scheduled time point. But in most countries, this is a holiday. Therefore, we're going to have a webinar on May eight, which is going to be a joint webinar with the CSF section of the ENS, and it's a, a the topic is uh, spinal cord herniations, which will be given by Marcel Ivanov. Uh, so please come for this next joint section webinar of this CSF section and the spine section. So finally, uh, all enjoy the evening. Have a good evening. Thanks again, Klaus. Uh, have a good night. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks.